Well, we have all had those flavorless watery strawberries or cherry tomatoes, natural foods that taste like anything but what they're supposed to taste like. All the while, manufacturers are making accommodations. They enhance processed food with strawberry and tomato flavorings. Author and journalist Mark Schatzker calls this the Dorito effect, and he joins us now to discuss his book of the same name. Hi. Hello. Okay, the Dorito, what a, what a catchy title. We'll talk about Doritos. I want to start because your book has sort of challenged I mean, challenged, uh, informed, and sort of, you know, I knew these, some of these things about everything I've ever thought about food, right? You've, you've challenged all these norms. I want to start by reading a little bit about the Dorito, because I found this, I don't know if I want to say shocking, but it bothered me. Here we go. The Dorito didn't just predict the future of tortilla chips, you right, right? It didn't just predict the future of snack food either. It predicted the future of all food. Nothing tastes like what it is anymore. Everything tastes like we want it to taste like. As food gets blander, we crank out zestiness by the hundreds to make up for it. Most people recognize this as junk food, but it's happening to food served at restaurants and the food people buy at the supermarket and cook from scratch at home. It's happening to blueberries, chicken breast, broccoli, and lettuce, even fennel. Everything is getting blander and simultaneously more seasoned. Everything is becoming like a Dorito. Mark goes on to write, the birth of Doritos was a watershed moment Flavor wasn't up to Mother Nature anymore. Now it was in the hands of the folks in marketing. The Dorito, really? It did all this? The Dorito, I, I called the book The Dorito Effect because it tells us so much about what happened to food. It, it got there first. It's incredibly successful. We think of it as junk food. But what disturbs me is that so, all food is following that path. OK, that so let's go back to the Dorito. When did this thing, when did I first when was I first able to go eat a Dorito? Where did this all start? In the early 1960s, uh, a Madison Avenue ad man, a guy named Arch West, was poached by the Frito Chip Company to come and work in Texas, VP of sales and marketing, selling Fritos. Very soon after that, it merged with Lay's and became Frito-Lay. This man took his kids on a trip to California. Um, it's so emblematic of the era. He piled the family of five into a two-door Lincoln Continental. <laughs> just like, wow, there wasn't a third row of seats. Um, and they stayed in Orange County, and the family was driving south to San Diego, and Arch West spotted what he described as a little Mexican shack by the side of the road. And he had to pull in. He wanted to see what it was like, and he ordered some tortilla chips. And he bit into them, and he said, this is going to be the next big thing for Frito-Lay, tortilla chips. He brought the concept back to Dallas. He presented it to the board. He said, this is our next big thing, and they shot him down. They said, I don't think so. We already sell Fritos, basically the same thing. Plain potato chips. Corn chips. Corn chips, okay. Fried corn chips. And when you think about it, there's not that much different between a Frito and a tortilla chip. But Arch West knew better, and he, he funneled discretionary funds to an off-site facility. He went behind their backs, and he developed the tortilla chip concept. He even came up with a name. It meant little pieces of gold, apparently, in sort of a pigeon Mexican Spanish. And he represented it, and he said, gentlemen, I give you the Dorito. The Dorito. The Dorito, and I know what you're thinking. This was the birth <laughs> of this snack food, but it wasn't. The Dorito almost never happened, because when they first launched it, it flopped. The very first Dorito, launched in 1964, was just a salted tortilla chip, and it didn't sell that well. It sold in the Southwest of the United States because there was a Hispanic cultural influence. People knew these things are fun to dip in guacamole or salsa or a bean dip. Everywhere else, mm -hmm. the complaint was, this snack sounds Mexican. It doesn't taste Mexican. And this was almost the death of Doritos, except this is where Arch West had the world-changing insight. Okay, so what does he do? He says, let's make them taste like taco. <laughs> let's make Doritos, a plain corn chip, taste like taco. Okay. And that's what he did because it was at last possible to do this. The technology existed, flavor technology. And because what, what was it? People like tacos. They bought into eating tacos. Tacos are delicious. Okay. So, so you can make a Dorito. Now, the way that you used to be that you made a Dorito taste like a taco would be to put, you know, maybe some, some uh, braised pork and cilantro and chopped onion and a squeeze of lemon. Now you could do it with chemical flavorings. This technology was about 10 years old at this point, and it was very powerful. And it wasn't until this moment, it wasn't until they made the Dorito taste like taco that it became so irresistible, so delicious, and so wildly successful. The next flavor was nacho cheese, which we all know, we That's all love. That's what I think of when I think of the Dorito. When you think yeah. of the Dorito. And this, it's such an example of how powerful this technology is that you could make, this was never possible up until now to make something taste like something mm -hmm. that it isn't. I mean, we're so used to it, but for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the only thing that tastes like an orange 
was an orange. The only thing that tasted like a strawberry was a strawberry. Now we can make anything taste like what we want it to, and we do it all the time. Okay, because we're gonna spend the next hour over the next two nights talking about flavor. Um, how, you know, if you think of all the things that's important, important, uh, in what we put into food to eat, like what, what draws us to it, where does flavor rank in all of this? Well, uh, in terms of nutrition, it's a total zero. We never talk about it because flavor chemicals are not toxic. They're also essentially non-nutritive. There, there's no calories there, there's no protein, there's no antioxidants. From a nutritional point of view, they don't seem to do anything, which is why people have always never really noticed them. They're benign, they're harmless, mm. who cares about flavor? However, let's talk about it from the experience point of view. When we eat, we don't experience nutrition. We don't say, my gosh, I'm getting a real hit of protein here. <laughs> it's all about flavor. F flavor basically is the language of deliciousness. It's what makes food seem like food. So when you're talking about why people eat and how, you know, do they like what they're eating, that is all about flavor. Right, we say, does it taste good? Does it taste mean, good? Is it flavorful? Exactly. Okay, so um, we've been warned about things like gluten, salt, and sugar. Flavor, we, as you said, we just kind of like, meh, it's flavor. It's flavor. Because? Because I think it has something to do, I, I mean, I've racked my brain over this and there's no easy answer. Uh, culturally, we have ignored it. I think it's our puritanical background, uh, the Protestant ethic, if you like. We think pleasure is an indulgence and it never takes you to a good place. Um, I think that's changing somewhat if you think, for example, of how our, our understanding of sex has mm -hmm. changed over the last 50 years. I think we're liberalizing a bit, but f we've always been suspicious of flavor. There's that great line, if it tastes good, spit it out. We think <laughs> anything delicious must be bad for us. Um, so we've kind of ignored flavor because we're so smart, we know so much that we know food is all about the nutrients. So forget about all that silly stuff about flavor. It's about protein, it's about carbs, it's about calories. And that has been our approach, has been completely nutritionally oriented, mm. that we can go out there into the world and conquer the food problem because we're so smart and we're all master nutritionists and I can't have that, it's got too many carbs and I'm counting calories. The truth is we're all terrible at it. And the truth is, when you look at what has happened uh, to obesity since the 1960s, it's been a total failure. Our campaigns against fat, against carbs, against sugar, high fructose corn syrup, gluten, have all been total disasters. It has not worked. Right. The problem we're trying to fight keeps getting worse. Worse. Okay. And we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. You wrote a book about steak. Yes. And now you're the guy who's written an entire book about flavor. Yes. Is there a connection between There's the two? Absolutely, yeah, because it was the steak book that brought me here uh, for two reasons. When I set out to write the steak book... I, Basically, I, you traveled the world and ate steak. Yes, and I did not care. I mean, part of me cared about whether this was an ethically produced steak. Part of me cared about things like the carbon footprint and the nutrition. But really, I just wanted to write a book for steak lovers. Who's got the best steak? Um, I was expecting this steak because I carried that prejudice we all have against flavor. I thought, well, the best steak is going to be... It might kill me. It's going to be mean to the cow. It's going to have a worse carbon footprint than Saudi Arabia. And it's going to be mean to my body. And what I found is the steak that I like the best is grass-fed steak when it's well done. And it was a total shock because grass-fed beef has a much better nutritional profile. It's more nutrient dense. The cow leads a much better life. Uh, there's no carbon footprint. So it's this odd win-win-win, which I really didn't expect. But there was another interesting insight when I did that book because grass farmers talk about bricks. The other people who talk about bricks are wine growers. That has to do, they say, with the dissolved sugar in grapes or grass. And the grass farmers who want those cows to eat the really good grass are always talking bricks, bricks, bricks. And one time I approached a kind of a, a, a very prominent figure in the movement and I said, well, you guys are always criticizing the big feedlots for jamming corn down everyone's, well, not everyone's throat, but cattle's throat. Mm. Uh, but all you're talking about is bricks. So you're talking about a simple carbohydrate versus a complex carb. You're no better than the feedlot guys. And he goes, you know, that's a really good point. But the truth is, when we measure bricks in grass, we're not just measuring sugar. They talk about sugar. It's a measure of the dissolved nutrients. So in grass and grapes, sugar is indicative of total nutrition. You get more minerals, you get more antioxidants, you get more vitamins. So it's kind of a marker of this food approaching a state of nutritional perfection. And that made me rethink the whole way we approach flavor. The interesting thing about cows is they've never taken a course in nutrition. <laughs> they never read wheat belly. 
mm. and yet they can walk across a field and so perfectly meet their nutritional needs. Uh, a pregnant cow has a higher protein requirement than, than a steer, for example. It somehow knows to eat more alfalfa than ryegrass. Mm. How does it know that? It doesn't even know that there are names alfalfa, ryegrass, legume. It, it's guided by what it finds delicious. And this told me something's going on with flavor. We're looking at this all wrong. We're running away from something that may actually have the potential to really help us out. Mm. So that's what got me on this course of asking, it seems to me the question no one's really asked about food, which is why is food flavorful in the first place? Which is, and the answer is we add it to everything. So, so it's kind of hard to deduce what, flavor's it, important. Well, in our food environment, it's a very difficult question to ask because we've become master manipulators. But what did it mean from an evolutionary point of view? Why are, why are we born into this world with this incredible flavor sensing equipment? Um, it's interesting to consider, you, you, me, we all sense flavor with our nose and our mouth. Right. It takes more DNA to write the instructions for that system than any other part of your body. It's incredibly important from an evolutionary point of view. You would not have it if you didn't need it. So what's it there for? Okay, we're, we'll, we'll, we're gonna talk about evolution and, and how we got to here today, flavor-wise, uh, in a bit. But I wanna, because I'm obsessed by this chicken bit. Yes. So I read in your quote there, you basically said, um, chicken sucks. <laughs> it <laughs> does, modern chicken, said. absolutely, okay. yes. So we talked about, we'll talk about fruits and vegetables as well. But, because I always say chicken only tastes like whatever you throw on top of it, right? Yeah. Like, so whatever you marinate, it's like tofu, right? It just soaks up flavor. Other than that, no one just cooks plain chicken. It's like a tortilla chip. It's, it's, a, like a, tortilla it's a texture chip. vehicle. You say in your book, it wasn't always that no. way. Chicken 60 years ago used to taste like what? Like chicken, which is meaningless to <laughs> someone who's never tasted chicken, but there's no good way to describe real chicken to, to no one who's never, imagine trying to describe what an orange tastes like to someone who's never eaten an orange. It's You'd say it's fruity, it's yeah. you know, bright, it's a little citrusy. bit acidic, citrusy. Yeah. What does that mean? It's, you know, it's a tautology, essentially. Right. Uh, but chicken tasted like chicken. And when you eat a real chicken, um, it's, it's an unbelievable experience. What's a real chicken nowadays? A real chicken, uh, you know, an heirloom chicken. A chicken, it, essentially a chicken that grows a lot more slowly and spends a lot of time outside eating the things that chickens always ate up until about 50 or 60 years ago, which is to say grasshoppers, bugs, leaves, Blades of grass, seeds, they whatever it wants, peck, worms. Peck around, whatever peck around. was there. Yeah. Okay, and then breeding changed over the years. We started force-feeding chickens, doing It started stuff. Uh, in 1948 with the Chicken of Tomorrow contest. Um, World War II, red meat was rationed. Um, we didn't eat a whole lot of chicken back then. Chicken was expensive, and it was a Sunday night roast. Chicken consumption shot way up. With all that red meat being sent overseas, domestically, people started eating a lot more chicken. So this was a really good situation for the chicken people. But then the war ended and they got scared because they thought, GIs are coming home, the rationing's gonna end, what's gonna happen to this booming market for chicken? So they held a contest. What they wanted to do was create a chicken that was essentially more efficient, grew faster, more meat, cheaper price. So they held a contest. They sent wax models of chickens around the country. This was in the States. Okay. And they said, whoever can grow a chicken that looks like this, the fastest, wins. They and put it was a, a plump wax model? Yeah, oh yeah. It, I mean, nothing like today's chickens. That's the thing. If you looked at that now, you'd think that's a scrawny looking bird. But back then, that was a plump looking bird. $10,000 in prize money, which was a lot of money back then. And they held regional contests. And then the, the finalists from those contests were in the National Chicken of Tomorrow contest. And there was a winner from Vantress Hatchery. It was a cross, uh, I believe it was a New Hamp and a Cornish cross. These were two breeds. Back then we had the, the heirloom breeds, mm. people knew about different breeds of chickens, and it won, it grew the fastest. Um, a, an unbelievable slowpoke by today's standards, but a huge improvement by their standards. What really started to happen then was professional chicken breeding, where we started to get an idea of genetics and how we can essentially mold organisms by breeding them. Say, I'm gonna cross this big fat chicken with this one that grows really quickly and get an offspring that is both fast growing and big. Mm. And that's what they got and we kept doing it. Um, the Chicken of Tomorrow contest winner was just over 12 weeks old. We're now at around six weeks. And 12 weeks was like a, a sprint back and then. And how big, how many, how many kilos? Uh, it would have been, I'm trying to recall, some, the carcass would have been something like a four pound, so just under two kilos. Okay. Um, 
We have gotten much, much better at it. We've improved feed efficiency, which is to say the amount of feed that it takes to get one pound of meat is now sitting at about two to one. It used to be more like four and a half to one. Chicken has become unbelievably efficient. It's become abundant. It's cheap, and we eat a lot of it. We eat more chicken than any other meat. So by all those standards, this contest was enormously successful. This, this, this uh, project of chicken improvement has mm -hmm. been amazing. It, it was a total success. It, I mean, it, it smashed everyone's expectations. The question is, was there a price? Did we lose something? And what was that price? The price was flavor. Mm -hmm. um, chicken has completely lost its flavor for two reasons. One is that um, animals tend to get more flavorful as they get older. That's why lamb is milder than mutton. That's why veal is milder than beef. And that's why the chicken we eat today is milder than the chicken of 60 years ago, because we eat giant babies. Uh, chickens are only six weeks old. This was still just a kind of a large-sized chick once upon a time. Now it's a full-grown chicken. If, um, this is a line out of a, of a paper in poultry science. This is not any kind of an exaggeration. If a human baby grew as fast as a modern chicken, by the time it was two months old, it would weigh 660 pounds. What? We have, we have bred race car chickens. They, it's unbelievable what they do. Hmm. It's unbelievable how efficient it is. But what's that chicken like? Well, well when, do, I mean, how, have we collectively sort of, when did we start understanding, hey, yes, we're you know, breeding them faster, they're bigger, they're more efficient. Did we start noticing, hmm, wait a minute, these don't taste as good as the old guys? S some people did. I mean, if you look in cookbooks, uh, 1962, uh, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Julia Child says straight up, modern chicken breeding has done wonders to produce a plump, fine-looking bird but it tastes like teddy bear stuffing. She noticed it. <laughs> I documented in all sorts of uh, cookbooks, Paula Wolfert in the early 70s saw, uh, in Couscous, um, writes about how modern uh, scientifically bred chickens, you need to rub them with garlic and do all sorts of things. So the cooks noticed this. Why didn't, in France they noticed it. They actually set up a standard for heirloom chickens in the early 60s to basically say we need to preserve what real chickens taste like. For some reason, culturally, we were very happy just to get t cheap chicken. Yeah, we said it was a trade-off, right? It's, yeah, whether, and the other thing is this happened so slowly. It's not as though one Tuesday morning everyone woke up and said, oh my God, the chicken's utterly changed. It happened, the improvement happened very slowly. So it would have been a gradual drop-off. There's no question there's people who notice it. There's all sorts of old-timers who say chicken doesn't taste like it used to. My grandfather said that. Um, but generally speaking, it changed. And is the industry who, who, as you've laid out, I mean, is benefiting from this or raising them faster, uh, cheaper, all those things. Are, are they realizing at any point in this trajectory that they're sacrificing quality for quantity? Do they care at all? I don't think they care. They generally care what, what are people buying. They're driven by balance sheets. They're driven by the fact that they have to show a profit every quarter. So I think some of them are aware of it. Um, I spoke to a scientist, um, a, a flavor expert who long ago developed um, a diet uh, and started adding herbs to chicken feed to get them to taste like something. Um, and he, he approached an executive of a major chicken company who said, essentially there was all sorts of reasons they couldn't use it. But he said, if you can figure out how to make a chicken taste like chicken, that I would buy. So they knew, they knew that chicken had changed. Mm. Um, it, it is interesting that you, that you say that because if you think about it, we flavor all kinds of things with quote unquote chicken flavoring. Yes. If chicken's so bland, <laughs> What is chicken flavoring trying to recapture what a chicken once tasted like? We actually add chicken flavoring to chicken. That is not true. It is. If you look um, on the ingredient panel, uh, I've seen in all sorts of supermarkets, more south of the border, um, you see as an ingredient in chicken flavoring. What do you mean? Cooked chicken? Not, no, I'm a not, raw I'm, chicken. A raw I'm, chicken. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to my grocery store. I'm like, mmm, chicken breast, pull it off. And you're telling me at some places that's been infused with chicken flavoring. Yes. Pork as well, beef as well, because nothing tastes like anything anymore, so you got to give it flavor. This seems counterintuitive to me. Why wouldn't we just go back to make growing a chicken, raising a chicken to taste like a chicken? Because it's the marketing. It's marketing. It's easier to do this, frankly. It's cheaper. It's cheaper to manufacture the flavorings, and it's cheaper to manufacture a cheap chicken and just put the two together. Make it like a Dorito. All right. Okay, I'm going to check my ingredient list on my chicken breasts. Um, I want to talk about, because we talked, you mentioned this in the quote that I read as well, about produce, fruits and vegetables, blueberries, lettuce, broccoli. You said all those things are 
you know, just blander than they were, again, about six decades, six decades ago. So again, because I know it's hard to explain what a tomato or broccoli tasted like 60 years ago. But try, try and tell me what, what, what was delicious about a tomato? Well, I think we know something about what tomatoes used to taste like by uh, growing a tomato in your backyard sure. or maybe buying an heirloom tomato at a farmer's market. We've all occasionally had those tomatoes that are unbelievable. They're like a revelation. Mm. Uh, a tomato that's good enough where you can just make a tomato sandwich. You don't, you don't want cheese, you don't want ham, you just want this tomato. The kind of tomato where in Italy you might have a caprese salad, which is beautiful mozzarella with an incredible tomato. Tomatoes can be unbelievable. They very rarely are now because we did the same thing tomatoes that we did with chicken. We improved them. We have cranked up the output unbelievably. We have tomatoes at all times of year. They are incredibly productive. They're very cheap and they taste like cardboard. They became bland. They became bland, yes. All in the name of we can have this all year round. I mean, there is this sort of balance. And cheaper. It's, it's, it's cheaper. cheaper, but not, I, I mean, it's not just a nefarious industry. It's also consumers want tomatoes all year I'm round. I'm not blaming industry. Okay. I, well, they're partly to blame, but we're partly to blame. Mm. Everyone thinks everything should be 99 cents a pound, and I should be able to get it whenever I want. And I don't care if my tomato tastes delicious or like water. Yes. Okay. Because you can dump ranch dressing on that tomato. <laughs> so, but this is why tomatoes are also like a Dorito. Because to make that delicious, to make it consumable, we destroy the nutrition. When you take a cardboard tomato and dump ranch dressing on it, what's happened to the health profile of your meal? It's no health, it's gone bad. It's gone the, yeah, in the wrong gone direction. It's gone to the ranch. But yeah. think about that great tomato. Think about how little you need to do to that. You just put a little speck of sea salt on it, some olive oil, maybe an herb mm -hmm. from your garden. And yet it's, uh, I think when you're thinking of how much you're satisfied on, a, on a, a budget of calories, that great tomato makes you happy on a really low calorie budget. It's unbelievable mm. what it pulls off. You know, it's funny that you mentioned ranch dressing because I think if you were an alien, you came to earth and someone said, put ranch flavoring on this. I said, well, what the heck is that? And you told them what a ranch was, they'd be like, I don't want to eat that. We bought into all this flavoring business. Yes, because it works. And if you look at the ingredient list in ranch dressings, there's a lot of flavorings in there. Mm. Um, it's, it's pervasive. Where does this not um, take place? So if it's happening to our produce, it's happening to our meat and poultry, is there any sort of safe zone where we can go eat things like they're supposed to taste? I think farmers markets are a good example. Not everything there, but uh, I think a lot of those farmers are driven, um, I think the way they separate themselves from a supermarket and offer something different is by offering something that actually tastes good. Um, there are some tomatoes coming on the market that taste better. Um, they cost a bit more money, but there are some early efforts to to push things back in the right direction. So I think that's exciting, for sure. Um, so you go to farmer's markets, and, and I would say to you, okay, that's great, Mark, because you live in a big urban city, and mm -hmm. you can go to these, and you have money that you can spend at a farmer's market. Which, what, what is the message to consumers, like beyond us, beyond us sort of downtown Toronto urbanites, about what we're consuming and putting into our bodies? The message is that we should care a lot more about the way real food tastes, because we all, it's one of the, most important things we need to be doing as a society is eating better. The cost to our poor diet is very high. Obesity is the number one preventable cause of disease and the number two preventable cause of death. It costs us billions of dollars. Um, they had to change the name of type two, uh, of adult onset diabetes to type two diabetes because kids are getting it now. Mm. We used to eat food to live, to survive, and now it seems to be the thing that's killing us. So I see this as a real problem. We've, we've had all these, sort of battles over nutrition and what we should be eating, but on some level, we've known for an awfully long time, the answer is to eat more whole foods, to eat more fruits and vegetables, more whole cuts of meat, less processed food. If that food doesn't taste good, people aren't gonna eat it. The truth is, um, we don't all have these ironclad wills and can somehow will ourselves into eating. It's like uh, preaching abstinence and sex. It doesn't really work. Mm. We go for where the pleasure is. That's how we're wired. So what we need to do is get the pleasure back into real food if we want people to eat it. I see that as an extremely important project, pu mm. like public policy. It's essential that we make the right food delicious. You know, I want to get back to the chicken just for a minute because I was out uh, with some friends the other night. Somehow chicken came up. One, they were served at this dinner party. One friend said, oh, I don't like chicken. Doesn't taste like anything. They was like, chicken's delicious. And I was like, chicken does, you know, whatever you put on chicken. Anyway, if we broke out into an argument over this, mm -hmm. which, which makes me want to raise this point. Isn't um, taste just subjective? Like one thing that you find flavorful, I don't. Isn't that just subjective? There is a subjective quality to it, but it's not entirely subjective. It's rooted to something. 
um, I believe it's rooted ultimately to nutrition. I mean, it's, there's cultural influences, there's trends, there's what your mom made for you. Um, I would also argue you can make modern chicken delicious. Uh, we do it all the time. About half of chicken is called further processed now. That means chicken nuggets, chicken patties, chicken cordon bleu. That stuff's all flavored. So there's a way to make chicken delicious the same way we make Doritos delicious. Um, when you look at how you have to cook a modern chicken, I mean, this is one of the reasons no one cooks anymore, because it's so hard. When you look at how chefs cook chicken, they brine them. You've got to brine it for like 12 hours. Making a brine, you've got to boil water, dissolve salt and sugar in it, then you've got to put garlic, rosemary, all sorts of things. And you've got to dunk your chicken in there, keep it cold, so it's really hard to fit a thing of brine in your refrigerator. Then you have to flavor it with herbs and spices and cook it. No one has that kind of time anymore. <laughs> Only restaurants can cook a chicken like that. 60 years ago, chicken recipes were unbelievably simple, just salt and pepper. It, you think these people must have not had a palate or something, because you try that with a modern chicken and it's, it's disgusting, I and mean, it just doesn't work. But when you cook a real chicken, it's amazing how easy it is to cook because it's so flavorful. Mm. Okay, we have to leave it there for today. We'll talk more about the stuff, where it all came from, how do we fix all these problems. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.